This seminar is going to discuss fired heater deflagration. Specifically, we're going to be comparing deflagrations to detonations and discussing why when an explosion occurs in a fired heater, more often than not, it is going to be a weak deflagration uh, with a lot less damage than you would get from a condensed phase explosive that would give a detonation. So, Fired heater explosions are a very common event, unfortunately. Uh, they do occur very frequently in the process industries. They're generally the result of maloperation of a fired heater. And when that happens, you can get a cloud uh, of uncombusted fuel and air that when it ignites, it could result in a vapor cloud fire or a vapor cloud explosion. Now, generally, the severity of this fire or explosion is going to be limited because of the conditions that surround the event. Uh, and those are going to tend towards something called a weak deflagration as opposed to a strong deflagration or detonation. So that's why you don't expect uh, a fired heater to violently explode and send uh, shra shrapnel and, and fragments of the fired heater uh, in all directions. You don't expect to see a very large fireball. Uh, generally, in the worst of cases for fired heater explosions, they will kind of collapse and fall down uh, on top of each other. So let's start off with some definitions. These come from the CCPS Process Safety Glossary. So an explosion is a release of energy that causes a pressure discontinuity or a blast wave. We're creating a wave of overpressure, a, a pressure shell, if you will, that travels out. Um, this is going to be different from a flash fire. So a flash fire is when you have a vapor cloud that burns, and it may burn rapidly through a diffuse fuel, such as a dust, gas, or other vapors of an ignitable liquid, but it doesn't pr produce enough overpressure to cause damage. And there's not that much overpressure that's required to cause damage. You could shatter windows at about 1.1 1 .1 psi uh, of overpressure in the worst case. Now, with respect to explosions, there are two different kinds, the deflagration and the detonation. Uh, so a deflagration is a combustion that propagates by heat and mass transfer through the unreacted medium at a velocity less than the speed of sound. That's going to be kind of a key metric uh, to decide between a detonation and a deflagration is the flame speed and the speed of sound. Uh, a detonation, on the other hand, is going to be a release of energy caused by a propagation of the chemical reaction in which the reaction front advances into the unreacted substance at greater than sonic velocity. So if it's supersonic, it's a detonation. Uh, if it's subsonic, it's a deflagration. Now, a little bit more detail on this uh, can be had out of the Gexcon Gas Explosion Handbook. Uh, where a deflagate, the deflagration again is uh, a combustion reaction propagating at subsonic velocity. Uh, and there's uh, kind of draw attention to the fact that it's with respect to the unburned gas immediately ahead of the flame. And that unburned gas is moving because it's being pushed by the shock wave. Uh, the velocity uh, is, of the unburned gas is produced by expansion. Yeah. So uh, in an accidental gas explosion, the most common mode is flame propagation. So um, while it might seem that a deflagration is not that big of a deal, it's not as bad of a, uh, as a detonation, uh, deflagrations can actually be worse depending on what material uh, is being combusted and how big of a shock wave you can get. Uh, it's technically possible to get a more damaging deflagration than a detonation uh, depending on what what is actually causing the explosion, the situa situation around the explosion. Um, so in the deflagration mode, the flame speed is going to vary from about one meter per second per second up to about 500 to 1,000 meters, of se meters per second. Um, and that's going to give you overpressures of a few millibar all the way up to several bar. Uh, and for those of you who are used to the English units, uh, a bar is going to be about an atmosphere or about uh, 
you know, sh just short of 15 PSI. So if you have several bar, we could be talking 30, 45 uh, PSI of overpressure, which we're going to see later is actually very dramatic. So don't be fooled into thinking a deflagration cannot cause massive amounts of damage because it can. Um, and uh, if you have strong deflagrations, your shock wave might be significant enough to where it can propagate, propagate uh, ahead of the flame. Now detonations, again, are going to be that supersonic uh, velocity. So your flame front uh, is going to be traveling immediately uh, behind your shock wave, giving like giving no time for the for the gases uh, to 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 be compressed or or, or or moved around, shall we say, uh, by the by by the actual shock wave, which is going to maximize uh, the the amount of pressure that gets generated. Um, fuel air mixtures at ambient pressure, uh, the detonation can be up to 2,000 meters per second, and you could get uh, overpressures close to 20 bar, which again, so for your more severe detonations are going to be much worse than your more severe deflagrations. But again, don't discount the damaging impact that a weak or that a deflagration can give you. Uh, detonation can either be de uh, initiated by detonating a high explosive charge, uh, which is uh, you know you you have to kick that um, kick that shock wave off, and you could do that with a high explosive charge. Or if you have a, a, a gas cloud that's going through a lot of obstacles and confinement, that is going to cause a lot of turbulence in the flame and it's going to allow it to transition from a deflagration to a detonation. Okay, so here's another table uh, from a, uh, a reference from 1953, so not the most recent, uh, but it kind of gives you some of the differences between a deflagration and a detonation. Uh, so flame speed U uh, versus the, the speed of sound A, so you're, you're generally looking at uh, uh, much lower than speed of sound in a deflagration, whereas you're looking at much higher than the speed of sound uh, in a de detonation. Um, and then you also look at the uh, the speed at which the flame moves, beginning versus end flame speed. So a deflagration is going to accelerate, uh, where a detonation actually has its peak of overpressure right when it starts and then it will decrease from there. Uh, overpressures, uh, deflagration, you're looking at about one PSI for the typical case um, or, or your, your ratio is going to be uh, uh, one. So uh, pressure before and pressure after, whereas you get a lot of compression uh, when you have a detonation. Uh, and then there's also density changes and temperature changes that are addressed by this. Uh, kind of, you know, the, the point is there's, you, you know a deflagration when you see it, you know a detonation when you see it, uh, but where do you get that transition is kind of, um, it's kind of like how long do you need to cook a soup before it becomes a stew? There's really, uh, while the definition has that clear cut line of uh, sonic versus subsonic, um, you can still be subsonic and cause massive amounts of damage, whereas you can be supersonic but not cause uh, uh, as much damage depending on the situation at hand. Okay, so ultimately the chemical reactions are going to generate the, the shock waves and there's two different kinds of reactions I'm going to talk about that generate uh, shock waves. The first one is going to help to better explain a detonation and that would be a decomposition that you would see in for instance a condensed phase explosive. So up on the screen uh, we've got one of my favorite condensed phase explosives trinitrotoluene also known as TNT, it's dynamite. Uh, actually, contrary to ACDC's belief, uh, it is not dynamite. Dynamite is a mixture of nitroglycerin and a binding agent, usually diatomaceous earth. So TNT, not dynamite, but uh, still a solid condensed phase explosive. So 
the key here is if you look at the chemical structure and you look at the chemical reaction, it doesn't need, you don't need a fuel and an oxidizer. All of the chemicals are there in the starting ingredient. All you need to do is decompose and the molecules rearrange into lower energy uh, products than the, the the feed, if you will, or the, the, the reactant. Uh, so in the case of TNT, you're going to generate uh, 7.5 moles of hot vapor to replace one mole of a, sci uh, of a solid reactant. Uh, and that basically that huge increase in volume, also it's going to be hot, which is going to further increase it, is going to be what's generating this gigantic pressure wave uh, when trinitrotoluene TNT uh, explodes. Now, uh, if you look at a fired heater, you're basically looking at a combustion reaction. So all everything isn't in one molecule that's going to fall apart. Instead, you need two molecules or more to come into contact with each other. And that's necessarily going to slow things down a lot. So methane and oxygen have to meet in air. And when they do, you're going to re get a reaction that's going to create carbon dioxide and water. But you started with three moles of gas and you end with three moles of gas. So the increase in pressure is only as the result of the the heat that's generated causing a higher pressure as opposed to uh, more moles of gas being created. Uh, so you see that the, there's a massive difference between what's going on in a TNT decomposition versus a methane combustion reaction. The methane combustion reaction is massively less energetic. Okay, so now what you're looking at here is typical of what happens in a detonation. So in a detonation, all of that reaction is going to happen immediately because everything's packed very close together. There's no time required for the activation energy to spread out, for the molecules to come into contact with each other. So once it goes, you get that maximum overpressure immediately in a big spike. And then at the, the pressure wave is going to drop down as it travels. And it actually uh, goes negative, which causes other weird things to structure when it blasts. So that's what we expect in a condensed phase. But combustion, on the other hand, is mass transfer limited. Uh, it's generally going to be slower, and it's going to be a function of how quickly your oxygen and your fuel get together. So if you look at a log, uh, you can bring it indoors, set it in a fireplace, and have a fire that goes for hours. But if you take that same log and you grind it into a very fine dust, you can create a strong explosion. So uh, if you want to see that, I would recommend you search the internet for the Mythbusters episode with the sawdust cannon. Uh, it, you can make a piece of wood explode violently. Uh, it's all a matter of how quickly you can get the oxygen and the fuel together. So unlike what we saw for your condensed phase explosive detonating, causing that sudden shot up to the maximum pressure and then the decay off, uh, when you get a vapor cloud explosion, you're going to get a run up. You're going to start slow and the flame speed is going to build up as long as you're traveling through uh, an area that is very obstructed, is very congested, which is causing a lot of turbulence. But as soon as you leave that highly obstructed area, you're going to see the flame speed fall back off and go close to laminar. Uh, which is kind of what, what you'd expect from a methane reaction. So uh, what you see on the screen here is a cyclohexane air uh, mixture, which is going to be a little bit more reactive uh, than you would get for methane. Plus, you're going to get a little bit um, more overpressure generated because you're going to get that increase in moles of gas as opposed to feedstock. So that's flame speed. Now, there are several things that contribute to the amount of overpressure that you're going to get. So overpressure is the primary measurement of the destructiveness of an explosion. So what is the wave of pressure? How much did the pressure change? And that shell of compressed gas, 
the the differential between the middle of the shell and ambient is going to tell you how much damage it's going to cause. Now, that's not the only thing. Uh, you'll be looking at the duration at which the overpressure uh, kind of stays impacted on the structure. You're going to look at how quickly uh, it arrives and leaves. So if it builds up more slowly, it's not going to be as damaging. But overpressure is the key thing that we're looking at. Now, overpressure is going to be a strong function of flame speed, as you can see in the graph on the top um, so as well actually what, what you see on the top is um, a, a flame speed versus blockage ratio so if you go to the right um, and the, the, the far right picture shows kind of the relationship between the velocity of your flame and the amount of overpressure that you're getting. So everything that you're looking at there 100 to 400 uh, is in the uh, the deflagration range. So, uh, so if you get that flame speed up to about 400 meters per second, you're going to be looking at about three bar, which is going to be about 45 psi. Uh, so that everything there is in the deflagration zone. Um, also, the distance of flame travel is going to be uh, a determinant of what the flame velocity is. So uh, flames are going to start slowly and they're going to build up speed as they move through your congested area. And if the flame doesn't have a very long path to travel, it won't get up to the speeds that are required to cause that damaging overpressure. Uh, and that's shown in the figure on the top where we look at flame speed versus blockage ratio. So the more blockage you have, the more torturous your path that the gas has to travel, it's going to generate more turbulence, which is going to make it easier uh, for the flame to in, 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 uh, uh, increase in speed. So what you're looking at now is going to be incredibly difficult to uh, actually see, but it's a table that kind of talks about the amount of overpressure versus the amount of damage that's going to occur uh, to pieces of equipment in a refinery. So things like windows breaking, gauges breaking occur down at about 0.5 psi, uh, 0.03 bar. And we were saying that, you know, maybe about a 1 PSI, a 2 PSI overpressure uh, is going to be something that, that that's achievable in even a weak deflagration. And there, you know, you could be talking about damaging structures, damaging tanks, uh, damaging instrumentation, uh, but it's going to take something like you know, about uh, 30 PSI overpressure, 1.4, which is the last column all the way over to the right. If you get to that kind of overpressure, you will be able to pick up turbines, pick up uh, compressors, compressor motors, and actually move them. And as we saw, for a very strong deflagration, that is actually possible. Uh, it's, it doesn't require just a, def, uh, a detonation to have that kind of damage. It can be done with the right kind of deflagration. So, but even so, th this, this slide brings it home. I, I, I kind of wanted to stress that you, you can't just look at uh, a deflagration and say, no big deal. That's absolutely not the case. But the deflagrations that we're going to get inside a fired heater box are not only deflagrations instead of detonations, they are weak deflagrations. You don't expect to get it, it, it's really hard to say because no one's out there blowing up fireboxes and taking measurements. Uh, but you're not expecting the damage that you see is going to be consistent with something around maybe one PSI of overpressure, maybe less. Why is this the case? Well, in a fired heater explosion, you have a vapor cloud explosion, not a condensed phase. Uh, detonation of an explosive. So it's not TNT, it's going to be a methane cloud. Furthermore, most of the material in the firebox is inert. You are combusting your methane with air, which is about 78% nitrogen. So most of what's in the firebox is going to be nitrogen, um, unless you're super fuel rich, but that's, that, that's 
we'll get we'll get to that when we talk about it not being stoichiometric. Um, so uh, the 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 nitrogen has a lot of effects. It makes it harder for the reaction to propagate because there's uh, nitrogen blocking the path uh, between your reactants, and furthermore. Heating up the nitrogen is going to rob some of that, that temperature increase, which is going to decrease the amount of activation energy available to cause the ignition to go further. Um, furthermore, uh, number three, the volume increase, as we've already discussed, of methane is limited to the heat of combustion. It's not like you're taking one mole of reactant and generating three or seven or ten moles of product. Uh, so the increase in pressure generated by by the combustion reaction is not that great. Number four, the material in the firebox is generally not near stoichiometric, especially if you're in operation and you're loading your firebox and then all of a sudden you give it some air. Well, the air is coming in at the bottom, you're fuel rich at the top, you're not really mixing these things together very well, um, which is item number five, which also makes it difficult for that combustion reaction to occur and to occur quickly. And that's what's required to get to that detonation. You've got to get that massive flame speed. Number six, the combustible material is only going to fill a portion of the firebox, not the whole thing. Seven, the flame travel through the firebox is not effectively obstructed, not enough to generate very high flame speeds. Mostly in a heater firebox, you're open. Uh, there are going to be tubes uh, in, in the firebox, but there, it's, it's not enough congestion uh, to, get you, to get that transition into the detonation. Um, also, I mentioned that distance is required in order to make uh, that detonation occur. So you don't actually have enough flame travel distance in the, inside the firebox to get you into those uh, really high uh, velocities and really high overpressures. Um, and then finally, number nine is that the firebox doesn't contain sufficient pressure to generate a physical explosion. Now, this is a little bit different. Um, if you have a fire or if you have an explosion, step back, if you have a combustion reaction contained in a pressure vessel and that combustion reaction generates more moles of product than it does reactant, you're going to increase the pressure inside that pressure vessel. And what a physical explosion is, is if the pressure inside a pressure vessel uh, exceeds its maximum allowable working pressure, then you get a sudden loss of containment. And all that uh, pressure, the difference between the pressure in the vessel and outside turns into what we call a physical explosion and that pressure differential generates that big shock wave. Well, fireboxes generally are not designed to withstand a whole lot of overpressure, uh, probably a PSI, maybe less. Also, the fireboxes are not exactly uh, designed to contain uh, vapors. So it's it's not a, a well-sealed pressure vessel. Uh, there are a lot of ways that the pressure can get out. So you're generally not going to be able to generate sufficient pressure uh, in the firebox uh, to generate a physical explosion. So this is why all these items are why it's, it's unlikely that you'll be able to uh, generate a detonation or even a strong deflagration in a firebox. Uh, now, I'm not saying it's 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 impossible. It it is in the realm of possibility, uh, but it would be very difficult to detonate a firebox. Uh, you would need a well mixed, uh, completely full firebox near stoichiometric, which in some cases is actually possible. And specifically, I'm looking at the startup case where you take your unburned fuel gas and your air at their design flows and put that into the firebox without a flame being present. So cold firebox, didn't try to start to ignite it, inadvertently left all your valves open. Then when you start the gas in the air, you are going to fill your firebox up with a close to stoichiometric ratio. And in that case, if you get an external uh, 
ignition. So we're going to want the uh, the ignition to travel from outside of the firebox into the firebox. Uh, and that might be, ha be able to happen with something like a of a flue gas regeneration system uh, where you kind of have a duct that's going to kind of allow a shock wave to fly through the duct before it gets into the firebox. Uh, and in a situation like that, it's possible to get a detonation, but uh, historically speaking, uh, you would be hard pressed to find an example of a detonation in a firebox. I know that I can't provide one. So, uh, in conclusion, misoperation of fired heaters can result in clouds of flammable gas and air mixtures in the firebox. Uh, if these mixtures are ignited, the clouds will generally result in a weak deflagration, maybe a PSI or less of overpressure in the shockwave, as opposed to a strong detonation. And this is why the explosions generally damage the heater, but the shockwave is essentially contained by the heater and doesn't spread out. Uh, and instead, it damages the heater. Now, if you're near the heater, if you're under the heater, uh, damage to the heater, heater collapse can cause uh, injury to you, possibly fatal. So it's it's not out of the realm of possibility to get uh, fatal injuries, even from a weak deflagration, uh, especially if you're in the wrong location and the collapsing heater falls on top of you. That said, the harm typically doesn't go long distances. You're not going to get a shock wave that's going to be moving pieces of equipment 100 or 200 feet away. It's not going to be throwing shrapnel uh, hundreds of yards away uh, from the source of the ignition. So typically, you're just looking at the collapse distance. So if you look at how tall a heater is and where it's going to fall when it's collapsing, uh, that's going to typically be the extent of the structures because it is the collapse of the heater itself that's going to be the primary mechanism to cause the most harm uh, to people and equipment. Thank you.